morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the State of Advanced Manufacturing. I'm Lisa Witter. I'm the co-founder of Apolitical and a, a young global leader, although I'm not young anymore. They still call me it, which I'm very grateful for. So thank you, Wef, um, for that. I'm going to be uh, moderating this panel today. Um, I wanted to point out in the background is the platform around the advanced manufacturing production. How many people in the audience know about WEF's platform? A few of you. OK. Um, <clears throat> this topic is actually really important to me. Uh, my company works with 170 governments helping public servants find out what they need to know around regulating or not regulating or creating the environment for businesses to thrive and change um, as the world is changing. It's also very personal to me because I grew up in a town. My mom made toilet paper in a factory for 50, she worked there 45 years. And she retired a month later, the factory um, shut down. And lucky for her, she kept her pension, but it really impacted the lives of my city, which is something I know that governments are thinking about in what is this future of advanced manufacturing? How do you reskill people? So I'm running a tight ship here. I live in Germany, and I've taken on the German way of very you know, punctual. You all agree with me? Yep, We're going to do. do this. Yep. OK, so to get started, I want to find out a little bit about you. Um, how many people are from the private sector? How many people run an advanced manufacturing center, some like a, a factory in some sort of way? OK, you're here for intelligence, great. How many people are from government? OK. How many people are from academia, media, cultural leaders? I see this session isn't full of the teen cohort that's at the conference today. You're supposed to laugh at that. Um, that's good. So um, <clears throat> I want to start off by also welcoming the live stream. We can wave to the live stream here. We have people from around the world watching. Um, and I want to ask a polling question. So if you can get your phones out, um, and we're going to start with a, um, a poll. If this doesn't work, we're going to go, it's funny to talk about advanced manufacturing. Um, but we'll see if the tech works. It's going to. Um, you can join at the uh, address there. So I'm asking, how would you rate the state of advanced manufacturing? One being non-existent, 10 being we've got it all figured out. Can everyone take a moment to, to vote? And on the live stream as well. And by the way, um, on the live stream or in the room, if you have questions, you can also send them to this link. Here they come. Wow, there's some very optimistic people here. It's one person. <laughs> Changing as the numbers go up. The law of averages say that usually people put five or six, so we'll see if that's it. OK, we'll give it one more minute. OK. So it seems like we're not at the one, two, three area, but we are, um, as people usually put, um, in the middle. So we'll watch how that, how that changes. So let me introduce the panel. Um, I'd like to start off with um, Rajiv Suri. He's the president and CEO of Nokia. Um, I asked each of them something about themselves that uh, informs the way they think that isn't obvious to the bio. He's lived in eight countries, religiously sleeps eight hours a night, and is a gym freak, which is why he looks so fit. Um, Alice Gast, who's a, the president of Imperial College in the UK, she's a fly fisher person. She likes to catch and release. And she's a chemical engineer. And she said to me, yes, molecules give you structure. So it gives you a sense of how she thinks about things. We have the minister of economy who said, I'm just a normal guy. And I had to remind him, if you're the ministry, minister of economy, you're not that normal. Are you OK with that? I'm OK with that. He's OK with that. And they went I on thought to I was. <laughs> and he went on to say that he's been married 50 years. Um, and he plays piano. Do you have a favorite piece that you play? Well, songs that my mother likes. Hmm, very nice. Brazilian songs. Brazilian songs. Maybe we can catch you later at the piano bar. You can take over. Um, and Mike Lassus, <laughs> he's the chairman um, of Or. You want to pronounce that? Orly. Orly in Early. Switzerland. He's known his wife. These guys answered this separately. He's known his wife since elementary school, and he did martial arts for 15 years. So I'm a bit afraid of him, which is why they set him next to me. Um, so I'm going to start. We'll, we'll go this way. Um, I've asked each of you to say what your state of manufacturing <coughs> is, um, what your number is, and give me a sentence on why you think it is that way. One word. My number would be three, I'd say, emerging. Emerging. And uh, you know we've seen, over the last decade, a productivity slump, uh, including in manufacturing. 
So it's still traditional, and we are going to see layout less factories in the future. They don't have to have this typical assembly line uh, structure. A lot more robotics and autonomous guided vehicles. And connectivity will change because connectivity today is largely Ethernet. And uh, that's reliable, but it's not flexible. And it's not what we call you know, uh, ultra reliable is what we will need <coughs> with very low responsiveness when machines talk to each other and when you want to have uh, cloud-based digital twins. So latency comes into play which is this whole responsiveness point. That is why 5G, and not just 5G, but also 4G connectivity will be the long-term solution, in, in fact. Great. Alice. I uh, had said seven. Uh, if you're in academia, you're an optimist, wow. uh, because you see the future emerging through research and education. And my word, it was one word, not a sentence, we were told to come up well, with. Then he had a minute afterwards. He did a uh, One word is smarter. Uh, because manufacturing is becoming smarter. We're able to optimize uh, for supply chain disruptions. We're able to optimize productivity. And we're doing that in really exciting research areas, uh, such as lightweight materials for transport uh, vehicles or advanced manufacturing of vaccines. And what excites me is that these are now uh, hot, hot areas for research and for education, and that wasn't the case a decade ago. Fantastic. To Brazil, the minister. Well, I would give three, two. Brazil was left behind. We lost this big wave of innovation and globalization. And I use the word uh, mind factoring, from labor with our hands to labor with our minds. Uh, this change will take a while, uh, but we are running after it. Mind you factoring? Mind factoring. Mind factoring. Fantastic. That's why I give three, because we are a long way. Uh, the future of manufacturing will be mind factory. So we'll talk more Super. a little later. Michael. I would stay more with a six to seven uh, because we are on a journey and we have successfully launched that. <coughs> Either it's IoT or it's uh, big data we have available meanwhile. We do development on materials meanwhile uh, on algorithms, not in laboratories anymore. And we can, uh, we can speed up that. So it's now to, to get the people behind, mm. to take the fear away. That's way to get them from 7 to 10, and to have an innovative environment where people are ready to spend. So trade wars are not, not useful for that. Mm. Innovation is always driven in a, in, a, in a bullish environment. And when people are scared, the first what they do, they stop innovation. That's why we have to keep momentum. Great. Trade wars are not helpful for innovation, says Michael Sassuri. We're going to move now to, we, we talked about the state. You each gave a word, and there was three and six and seven. So you guys were in, a, in, a, in different places, although coupled. Um, now I want to talk about megatrends as you see them um, in the field. In a word, what is the biggest megatrend that you see, and why do you see that? What does it mean? It's the advent of the industrial uh, IoT or Internet of Things. Uh, we talk very often about, you know, 50 billion devices will be connected and, and so on. What is 5G about? Uh, 5G is about uh, uh, higher capacity, higher speeds, and so on uh, for the consumer. But mostly it's about the opportunity to connect machines, not just things, but machines, and uh, to be able to predict on top of that with analytics and to have all of the, this data. I think 90% plus of the data in a lot of the physical industry is not being utilized or captured. 90%? Yeah, I, I think. Alice? Megatrend is uh, related to data. It's, it's AI. Again, only one word. I had to come up with an acronym, AI. Yeah. Uh, machine learning, data sciences, all the, all the elements of being able to capture <coughs> and really analyze uh, large amounts of data to make uh, rapid decisions more effectively, and and, uh, and that really is going to make a difference, I believe, in in these uh, optimization op uh, opportunities for uh, supply chains. In the trend towards um, whether one wants to distribute manufacturing into smaller uh, pieces more locally or still have um, mega centers in transport uh, things, there's a lot of really exciting work to be done there. Fantastic. I found the same uh, solution, AI, <laughs> one word, artificial intelligence. And um, it, it, industry has been a, a capital center based on capital. 
uh, and uh, we thought of educating people so that they could get a job. Uh, the big change is now uh, industry will be human-centered. And we'll have to adapt the machines, and not people anymore to get the job, but they adapt the machines to get the job done. Uh, so I think uh, this will be the great change uh, to value human talent, creativity, uh, even though uh, working will be reduced to the machines themselves through IoT and, and artificial intelligence. So we now have to qualify capital to participate in our production system instead of qualifying, just qualifying people to get a job on the system. Michael. Yeah, for me, it's the combination of, I, of IoT, AI, and then additive manufacturing. Because if you take additive manufacturing or 3D printing, either on polymer base or metal base, it's in an early stage, but almost all big companies have put significant investments and are running the show. It's a little bit slowed down with the overall in environment, but only two aspects. If you, if you have to send material, if you send it in powder, it's the best form. You, have, you could save probably 50% of all container ships to build because you manufacture where you need the parts. Mm. That's one aspect. The other one is decentralization and go away from scaling effects. Because for a printer, it doesn't matter if the next part looks similar or, e or different to the first part. Mm -hmm. So individualization, um, to do very f f f f fragile or, uh, structures, to grow parts like, in, like in, in, in nature. This is all things we have to start and we have to think in that world. Because as long as we're thinking in the world as I was trained, you have forging, casting, milling, drilling, welding, you have always this, all these limitations. And without these limitations, you have to start in a different way. Like we changed this, the, the, the two-dimension drawing board to a working station. And the people who worked on a drawing board have been very capable because they could look th things in three dimensions. That was nothing necessary in working stations because they, they showed it in any way the, how the part will look like. But to utilize the full force of that is something which you have to bring in schools, in, in technical schools, in university, we have to change probably the next five to 10 years all the curricula, yeah. because we need more horizontal strengths, electric know-how, mechanical know-how, material know-how, software know-how on one hand, and then you have to have experts which are going even more deeper and drilling deeper in their specific branch. And to combine that matrix will be completely different challenges for us as an industrial environment. Alice, do you want to add anything to that? I know education is a big piece of how you think of this. Is there advice to give people on both the mindset change but also the skill set change? Yes, and that was exactly your next question was about uh, threats and opportunities, and, I, and my word was skills, um, because I do think that it's both a threat and an opportunity. Mm. I think that uh, advanced uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, and uh, Internet of Things and AI are bringing new waves of talent to manufacturing, whereas they shied away uh, in the past decades. Uh, we have to let students know that manufacturing is not dumb, dirty, and dangerous. It's smart uh, and, uh, and clean and interesting and, and innovative. And I think that there's, there are tremendous opportunities. We have that combination now of research and teaching coming closer and closer. At Imperial College's Dyson School, we're working on 3D printing of metals, which is a challenging, challenging uh, area uh, from a, a physics point of view to get the materials right uh, with laser sintering and other methods. But that's also become an educational tool, and students can also try their hand at 3D printing and, and those same things. And so the education and the forefront research come uh, side by side. And that excites a new generation of students, and I think that's very promising. Arjeev, one of the things that Nokia is involved with is um, the lighthouse where people come and see how you're doing things. It's, it's learning by seeing and really being experienced. Could you talk a little bit about what you've learned in being a lighthouse? Are there other lighthouses here in the audience? No. What, could you explain a little bit what that is because it's in partnership with WEF and what you've learned? So what we did is we, one of our factories, our most advanced factory today, uh, in Olu in northern Finland, we... Uh, we automated it, so with robotics, and uh, it's got 4G and some 5G connectivity. 
uh, to do every, everything that I just said, right? So we wanted to untether the machines. The machines are tethered, they're, they're wired. And so we want to untether it so we can reconfigure it in a, in a fluid manner. And also for safety reasons, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned it's clean and, and, and safe and so on. So the results were fantastic. It's just been a couple of years, but the results were we got 30% year-on-year increase in productivity, mm -hmm. uh, especially in new product ramp-ups. We could get 60% you know, increase when it comes to new production, new product ramp-ups. The, the quality defects were down by 50%. And then uh, the lead time, which is very important in our industry, uh, the lead time is reduced by 80 percent, right? And, and this wow. is manufacturing, but when it comes to manufacturing, the, the private network within that facility has to talk to the wide area network as you go out in the logistics and the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And there are companies that I've worked with that just five minutes of better network connection reliability per day gives them $200 million of savings annually. So there's real money uh, involved here, plus safety, because factory number one you want is safe. Can I ask the audience, <clears throat> we, we heard um, a bunch of megatrends here. Anyone want to raise their hand and one word megatrend that you see in a mass manufacturing? Wasn't brought up? Did they cover everything? <laughs> Thank you, you guys were good, you covered everything. Does anyone disagree with each other on these megatrends? Nobody would like to add one, and this is where we are working uh, massively on. I do believe that materials will play an even more important mm. role in the future uh, and as a real parameter for design, mm. not only by 3D printing as well by coding. If I take or hot chrome, uh, a typical hot chrome line is, cr is, is creating 500 tons of toxic water every year. So we have a new, a new process where we do not have any toxic water. Mm. And additionally, you, you can rework the material afterwards. It's transparent for sensors and light but you still have a chromate surface. So, and, and that what I mean is with materials, you can impact so much the products and bring them a real step further, not only an incremental one, right. but a real one. Uh, yeah, I would, I would second that I would, uh, and say that, for example, naturally occurring materials, uh, we have a group working on uh, plastics made from chitin from the um, uh, waste products from lobster shells and and those are really exciting because they're not only from a waste product a natural waste product They're also easily recyclable and biodegradable and so these are the kinds of innovations that I think will change uh, Go through manufacturing you'll find all kinds of materials that can be used in uh, everyday life that will be uh, better that's exciting. Rajiv, um, Alice, when I asked her opportunities or threats, she said skills both on both sides. What do you see as the biggest opportunity or threat in this industry, 4.0, advanced manufacturing? Environmental, uh, uh, because what we're seeing is the operational technology will marry the uh, IT technology, so this IOCT, we call it, right? And uh, because 90, Again, the overwhelming majority of physical industries are not connected, and they'll all get connected. There'll be a lot of data that we will, we will get uh, through that. Uh, but environmental, because uh, that's a threat, as we all know, uh, but also as an opportunity, because um, let's take 5G. 5G is natively greener. It is more efficient from the use <laughs> of spectrum. Spectrum is a natural resource, uh, but also uh, the power consumption of the products that we work on in 5G is just much lower than it was in previous generations, almost 60% or more. So I think environmental is, is you know, uh, avoid environmental degradation is, is a big opportunity. Great, Michael. Um, from my side, I would say that uh, what we have to bear in mind, and maybe that goes a little bit away from that, what you, what you struggled, but. Why we, why we have that? Why after 47 years, uh, the WEF has discovered the industry as a platform? Mm -hmm. Because a modern industrial society is the core for all the standards we're looking for. Either it's social, it's economic, it's ecological standards. Look in systems like the old Soviet Union. They couldn't, they couldn't bring that. Look to countries which have only resources, no modern industry. They cannot compete on that. That's why we have to find ways how our societies, even in 50 years, can still be a modern industry society. Mm. And by that, we have to get rid of this perception discussion. We have to accept sometimes physics. <laughs> we can try to, to, to expand the borderline of this physics, but we have to accept physics. And then, based on that, not going with the, only with emotion, but really with the facts. And this is our job, to tell people, 
There is new things to come, which will consume old jobs, but we can create a lot of new jobs, maybe even better ones. But if you don't do that, and if you're only looking on one, in one direction, and I, I really want to point the finger on, if you only talk about climate change, we're jumping too short. Because climate change is one thing, water, as I touched, is another one, soil is the third one, food for food. the world, resources, mm -hmm. and in the end, to have a society which can afford to spend money for that, because it doesn't fall out of the blue sky. You have to earn it somewhere before that you can invest it in the right direction. And to maintain that momentum which we have today, that we are really willing to, re to reinvent what we are doing, not to stay with the old stuff. That's for me, that's the major driver why we have uh, advanced technologies now, uh, finally, in, three, in the third year now on the web. Because it's as, as, it was an energy business before. That's one sector. But manufacturing is covering by far more. Let me just ask a follow-up just to push you a little bit because it's, it's a really easy thing to say is don't be emotional, be fact-driven. But if you're sitting there with a vote in your hand and you listen to the politicians say, you know, we're going to teach everyone coding or, you know, you're going to be fine. We're going to... People don't hear that. So what... Really, like, if you can write talking points for politicians right now dealing with this every day all over the world, what do they say to the citizens to make them feel calm? No, the point is not... Not to be not emotional. I'm a very emotional person very often. <laughs> and I want to have things happening now, not tomorrow. But what I'm totally against is that we are running in perception, that people feel this is good, have no rational for that. And what we have to do is to put the rational stuff in a way that, you, that emotionally they can understand. Right. We have to get the people behind it. We have to, we have to find the right, the right frequency for, for transforming that messages. If we come only from the brain, we will not reach out. Because in, in the 70s, when you brought all the robots into the factories, there was a big wave. Hey, they, they will eliminate all jobs. In the end, they created more jobs. When we're saying today, um, climate change, it's an important factor, but it's one out of maybe 10. And we cannot rescue the world only looking on that one factor. We have to do it in a way that in the future, the system as well is working. And if I'm a politician, it's a difficult job because they think in three, four, five years terms. They have to learn to think in longer terms. And society as well. In the end, we have the politicians which we deserve. Yeah, I, um, it's very difficult when the brain, my background is uh, applied behavioral science, and the brain responds more to threat than opportunity, which is the biggest, one of the biggest challenges for, for politicians. So, Minister, I, I asked you a, a question um, around... What should government be doing or not doing to really push this, this field forward in an effective well, way for all the parties in the public-private partnership? In a country like Brazil, we are a little behind, not to say a lot behind. Uh, so we have a first level of concerns, uh, which is removing um, a hostile environment to business in general to receive and uh, redeploy all this knowledge that is available already. Uh, all, all over the world. And uh, like he said, it's a general equilibrium problem. So the worst enemy of the environment is poverty. People destroy the environment because they, they need to eat. They, they, they have other concerns, which are not the concerns of the people who already destroyed their forests, they already uh, fought their uh, ethnic minorities and all these things. So it's a very complex problem. It has no simple solution. Uh, but this first level is try to remove all these obstacles. Is something we are doing down there. Uh, but the second level, I would say, the most important thing to get this wave of the future is the key word would be connectivity. It's exactly what is going on here now. Uh, we are establishing right now, as we speak, uh, at least three new centers in Brazil. One is an affiliate center to the World Economic Forum exactly to promote. Uh, we created in Brazil already the forum with the industrialists, because we must put together the industrialists, academia, research, and education, and business people, because business people know how you have to generate sustainable businesses, uh, businesses that incorporate the values of society. So all of us want a greener uh, space. Uh, all of us need more food. 
So depending on the chemicals you use to get more food, you don't have the cleaner space. And this is a political solution. It is not simple, it's very complex. Uh, there is an, a balance between reason and how to communicate and, how to communicate and emotions. Um, uh, so what we are doing is exactly to creating an environment, trying to create an environment in Brazil. Uh, the first center is this affiliate center with the World Forum, exactly to explore the idea of mind factoring, how we get there. The second idea is, the second uh, um, is integrating the committee. We just were talking to Professor Schwab. Uh, there's a skills accelerator committee. They are putting to measure how things are going all over the world <clears throat> and get inputs from everybody to distribute later uh, these initiatives. So we are joining the committee. Uh, our people are already working with, with, with the World Economic Forum people. Uh, and basically to bring people from Stanford, uh, before coming here, I was at Stanford at another meeting, uh, but trying to bring uh, people who are uh, at the frontier, uh, industrialists together uh, and have regular meetings so that we could, I, I call it connectivity, the key word, because we should, if the, this process is, uh, innovation is a decentralized process. That's why Soviet Union and China in the past had problems. And the world, the Western world had success because uh, the capitalist system, creates innovation in a decentralized fashion. It promotes human talent. There's nothing standardized. So um, it's of essence to connect these conquests, these discoveries. So how to integrate a decentralized process of innovation? This is the big challenge. And for the latecomer, like Brazil, it's even more crucial. So I would say our main role as a government is not to innovate, is to make sure that we have a business environment, an academic environment that pr permits, allows us uh, to um, 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 appropriate all this knowledge. Remember, Brazilians invented the airplane. The Americans say it was uh, the, the Wright brothers, but we have, we have Santos Dumont, we invent the airplanes. So uh, we did some <coughs> interesting things in the past. Uh, and we are the second largest democracy in the world. So the voting power uh, there is very important. So people want to have the industries and the jobs. And at the same time, there is an enormous pressure to keep it green. So it's, it's a delicate balance, but we are pretty sure we will, we will accomplish it. So I, I asked you all in advance to think about what the biggest priority is for the next decade, and you've touched on it a bit in your, in your comments. So either answer that question or answer maybe a, a looking glass question. Ten years from now, we're sitting on this panel again. What will we be talking about? What are the missed opportunities you fear or the big breakthroughs that you can see coming? You get a crystal ball, you get to make the future. What do you see? Michael. From my side, uh, if we do it right, and right means that we do team up, that we do a partnering um, and, and by far more cooperation. You can do a lot of non-compete non cooperation and still then fail further on, on, the, on the end product, you can compete. But a lot of things to be done to boost the big data is how to use them, to get all these algorithms to get these new curriculas, to get a different way how, how academia and business and, and, and business models and technology are working together. If we do it right, and I think in additive we have started in a pretty good way. For me, the master piece is if you take jet engines or aerospace industry, they cooperate a lot. They compete in one engine, they cooperate in the next engine. Uh, so they exchange and they, because the challenge is too big for a simple, single one. Yeah. Or even for two, if they, two, if they have a bilateral partnership. It's simply too big. And if we do it together, and if we share that, and if we do it even transnational um, in that combination, then we can bring all that very promising things we have on a level that there's more participants, that there's more education, that there is less poverty, if we do that. If we're falling it back into unilateralism, we can do it by myself, internationalism, 
I'm a patriot, but I'm not a nationalist. Mm. I'm proud of Bavaria or Germany or in Europe, but I, I, I see a lot of other great countries. A nationalist only sees his country. If you're falling back in that, then we will not make it. And we will sit here in 10 years and say, we missed a big opportunity. Mm. We thought we can do it alone, by ourselves. And instead of that, everybody invents a little bit, instead of working together and boost that background which we have strongly to the next level. And I'm, I'm a positive thinking guy, so I believe in these corporations, they will happen. People will overcome that. And we'll, we'll sit here in 10 years and say, we have created a better world and we are on a better way. There's still a lot of things to be done because in 10 years we're probably 300 million more people on planet Earth, we will, but we will handle that. So you're, you're optimistic despite the trend that people are becoming more nationalist, but that's, that's why we're here. How about you, Alice? What do you, you get a looking, looking glass, what do you see? Uh, in a very similar vein, uh, I think that integration is really uh, important. Integration across sectors, uh, seeing universities working with corporations, working with governments. Um, I see our academics and our students really wanting to make a difference and have those real world partnerships, uh, those opportunities. It's also integration um, across uh, education uh, throughout the lifespan, and, and I would hope that uh, institutions of uh, higher education will start to find ways to educate people at different points in their lives and to help bring new skills and talents to them. And then, for me, it's also integration across uh, this AI data science realm and the materials in the, the real world realm. We have to remember that it's that interface uh, and it's partly Internet of Things, it's partly where the code hits the machine and, and how you actually make things. And, and I'm proud of the fact that we have some of the only wet lab incubators in London because there's so many incubators where you can go work on an app on your phone but fundamentally, people do have to make things with chemicals or with biology or with synthetic biology. That's true. And, and, and I think we're recapturing that sense of making and that excitement so you can be great at coding and learn uh, AI, but you can also work with the tangible world. So the visual of a cool startup guy, tends to be guy, but women too, is like of a hoodie playing ping pong. What is the visual of a cool manufacturing <laughs> worker? Is there one? So we, are, I mean, our, our, well, one of the most successful things we've done in the last five years is we innovate, women entrepreneurs innovate. And those women have come up with fabulous uh, startups. One is a materials related synthetic biology for membranes that are engineered to separate uh, waste products. Uh, and, and one can use biology to do that rather than chemistry. I mean, you find these incredible, um, and, and they want to take the product and all, all the way out to how you manufacture it, how you scale it up, and how you use it. And I think that that's where um, we have a gap in our kind of culture of entrepreneurial cool guys. And I think that there are real opportunities for that type of tangible, uh, real world uh, activity. And we could see a swing back to actually making things from this digital place that we're sitting in. Well, um, they need to be integrated. Yeah, Rajiv, where do you get a you get a crystal ball? And just a warning to the audience: I'm going to ask you your one word takeaway at the end of this. So start thinking about what that is. I think massive productivity growth. We haven't seen that in the previous industrial revolution, so for a while, for many decades, and we believe that you know as these industries digitize, as they, <coughs> all companies become tech companies with fundamental technologies like AI, machine learning, and robotics, and IoT and 5G and everything that we've talked about, uh, there could be a 35% productivity growth starting um, around 2028, 20, first in the US, and then you know maybe a few years later in China, India, and sort of many of the and EU and many of the other economies. Did you hear that number? <coughs> what was that? 35%. You you heard it here. 28. By 2028, 35%. That's pretty it's only bullish. Eight years. That's yeah. bullish. It's yeah. very very bullish. Anyone disagree with that? No, I don't disagree, but I would add that this is not only in the existing industrial societies. What we have to achieve is that more societies become industrial societies, that they can manufacture, that they have the capabilities, that they have the education. Because by that, you, you will not limit the world population without education. And you, you will not find an answer for all this resource demand with, with, to, to, to fight poverty and give people work. 
and to give people work to find an industrial system which can be more decentralized. So we don't have the scale effects, as, yeah. I, as I mentioned. We have the tools for that. Yeah. We have not only the ideas, we have the tools. And in the end, as, as, uh, as, as you said, we have to do things. We have to produce them. <laughs> the virtual world is pretty nice, but it doesn't feed you. Yeah. Yeah? You want to have a real, a real steak. Not yet. Or a real salad, whatever you, you prefer. <laughs> but it has to be real. Yeah. I'd like to turn to the audience. Does anyone have any questions for the panel? Any, yeah, right here. And if you could introduce yourself so we know context. Yeah, I'm Richard Perrington. I'm from the, the Natural History Museum in London. Cool. And obviously, we're really interested in the natural world. And I just wondered with the. Uh, this is Richard Harrington from the Natural History Museum. I wondered about uh, what the panel think about the, the, the now the distance we have between, if you like, the raw material source and then the advanced products at the end that we 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 deliver to the uh, to the consumer, and and whether um, you know for agriculture people understand more about where the the basis of manufacturing, uh, or in this case for a food product, comes from, and I wonder <laughs> if manufacturing. Uh, has, has some work to do to talk to people about you know, how the basic resource that goes into the new technology, how that's found and you know, how, we, how we carefully manage that whole, whole supply chain. So I wonder if there's any comment on that. Any other questions before we... Right here. Yeah, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you. Mike's coming. There we go. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Pawan Goenka from, my, from India. Uh, in emerging economies like India, the government always worries that will advanced manufacturing take away jobs. And while industry keeps trying to say, no, 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 but different jobs will come, nobody's able to explain what those different jobs would be for countries like India, not for US or Europe. Any, any views? Let's start with that one. Minister, do you want to take that? What are the new jobs that are coming? Well, I think when the first revolution came, everybody was very much concerned, and we created a lot of new jobs of higher order. and linking with what was said before, it's all about creating minimum, meaningful lives, better lives. All of us as, as a human species, we escape <coughs> from nature. We are the animal who escape it from nature. Uh, and then we use technology. First, we, at random, destroying nature here and there. But more and more, and that's the, the great um, view of, of the dynamics of an open society with democracies and markets, that the values we have as human beings penetrate the production system. So at the beginning, it's blind forces producing. It should be a very stupid life if you were just a guy in the Adam's mid time just pressing one screw here, one screw there. And uh, like she said, young guys today and, and, and kids, uh, they are thinking, they have dreams of meaningful lives, they, they, meaningful lives. They, they, they just don't want to get in a dark room and work hard and have uh, smoke on their eyes and their lungs. So we, we are changing and becoming more humans in the sense of having better lives. So I think this is exactly what will happen. We have a, an additional problem in India, Brazil, uh, because we were left behind. And the great chance now is exactly because it's a new revolution. And when a new revolution, new uh, tools are available, you can catch up. You can even ride ahead. Brazil is the fourth largest, and China and, and, and India, the third largest um, digital market in the world. So innovations in Israel will be tried in Brazil because they have technology, but they don't have scale. We have scale. So innovations in Silicon Valley are being tested in Brazil also. So we, I think these new jobs will show up. But more than that, services and uh, uh, more and more the value will be at the services layer. So we can catch up uh, if we have training, education, uh, but especially if we uh, are connected. Thank you. Alice, you want to tackle the, as humans, sort of we're further away from uh, sometimes these raw resources. you want to answer the, the very um, last question? Just to say, well, thank you. And we, we should follow up as next door neighbors. And, and it is the great role of, of institutions like the Natural History Museum, the Science Museum, the VNA, to bring these stories to life so people start understanding that pathway. Where did, where did this come from? I mean, how, how, did, how are things made? 
How are, uh, how are, and I think we all have to do that. Imperial College does uh, quite a bit of outreach to schools. Uh, we have jointly a great exhibition road festival. I hope you'll all come to town in uh, uh, early July uh, and next summer and, and see all the organizations uh, coming together to really get to the public to help explain some of these things. But I think there's a new opportunity as well, and we found it out in our White City campus where we have uh, what we call the invention rooms, and those are maker spaces. And bringing kids in from a very deprived neighborhood who aren't really excelling at school, they're not really interested in studying, but they have an idea and they make a prototype. They make that prototype, it totally changes their outlook about themselves and about their future. It's really transformative. And by making something with your own hands and taking an idea from your head into a physical uh, reality, I think is a great opportunity and gives us a way to help a generation of kids reconnect with where, where does stuff come from, Just <laughs> if I got your question right. No, no, got you. How many people, just out of curiosity, have built something with their hands in the last year? Not IKEA furniture. <laughs> OK, oh, this is an upscale crab, okay. perhaps not IKEA. Although I know many of you do have IKEA. So I want to wrap up um, doing two things. Um, I want to hear very, very quickly, I'm going to point at you what your one word takeaway. If there's one word, you're going to go back and share with someone what you took away from this. But it could be a feeling or a word. We're going to do it very quickly. While we're doing that, there's going to be polling up. And I'm going to ask you the question, are you leaving this session more optimistic about the future of manufacturing or less optimistic? So I'm going to start here. What's your word? Um, more. More? If you're not looking at me, I'm just going to go. More. 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 Lots of more. Productivity. Productivity. Skills. More skills. Talent. Talent. Humanity. Humanity. Collaboration. Collaboration. More. Skills. Connectivity. Connectivity. Human centric. Human centric. Disruption. Disruption. Integration. Connectivity. Connectivity. More. More. Better paying jobs. Better paying jobs. Productivity. Connectivity. Economic mobility. Back there? Retraining. Material science. Material science? Uh, Mind factoring. Evolution. Evolution. Human centered. Human centered. Collaboration. Collaboration. Productivity. Productivity. Let's go a little faster. <laughs> Cooperation. New skills. New skills. Stagnation. Stagnation. Change. Innovation. Innovation. Cooperation. Cooperation. Change. Anyone back here? Partnership. Back here. Opportunity. Anyone else? Um, it seems like a great setup for you, Francisco. We heard a lot of more and skills. And I know one of the things that uh, you are doing is bringing that, that co collaboration, that connectivity together. So do you want to say one thing about the, the platform? Just briefly, I mean, advanced manufacturing and production is one of the big 18 platforms for action and impact that we have here at the forum. So I think it's building on what Michael said. It's an invitation for all of you to stay engaged. I think the, the key thing is that we need businesses, governments, academia, and civil society working together to be able to capitalize on the new opportunities and make sure that at the same time no one is left behind. Great. Well, we, we're leaving with 67% are leaving more optimistic. So uh, All right. I want to thank the panel for firing us up. My, my number was 35%. Wow. Last word? It was a great event. <laughs> what a great meeting. Collaboration. Change. Change. Thank you, everyone. Have a great job. You did a great job.